The first one we're gonna touch on is tankless water heaters. With tankless, we will talk about some of the things you wanna look at as far as um, like design criteria, why you'd use it, why you wouldn't use it. Um, and even within tankless, we still have standard efficiency, right? So this one here on the left, you have your standard efficiency tankless, you have your high efficiency tankless, and then when you get into like the commercial application of things or the larger applications, a tankless heater only goes so far, so you've got to bank them together, okay? A lot of the tankless water heater technology now offers communication so that one heater can talk to another and um, they know what's going on, so on and so forth. You can build accumulative loads, all that other stuff. We're even seeing things now like, you know, pre-packaged systems. So in other words, you can order three or six or four or five, whatever your number is, hang it on a rack and be ready to go. There are some things though that might um, be overthought, uh, not overthought, overlooked, right? Or you don't necessarily think about. And sometimes literature can be deceiving, right? Because they have to appeal to the greater masses. And whether or not you guys know it, our climate in Minnesota is much different than Florida. Right? You don't always think that, but it's a true statement. When you look at instantaneous hot water heaters, instantaneous hot water heaters or tankless water heaters are on demand. So as you need hot water, it is literally making it on the fly. What we like in our shower may be 105 degrees or 100 degrees or 115, or if you just can't get that stain off your skin, you'll try and burn it off at 120 or 125, right? But whatever that number is, we have to understand what the heater has to do to achieve that number. And one of those things it has to do is overcome the inlet water temperature. Many of the brochures, many of the topics, the charts will show you uh, like a 50 degree rise, right? Um, or sometimes even less, it just depends. But what they say is, okay, down in Florida, Alabama, Texas, you might have words upwards of 65 or 60, 70 degree inlet water temps. Now the heater's only overcoming a 50 degree rise, right? Even if we want to do 120. Minnesota, we have a little bit different scenario, right? We're in the 45 to 50 range, better part of the year, okay? So when we're looking at the size of our unit and what it will do, we have to be careful and make sure that we're actually looking at the degree rise, okay? This column over here on these charts to tell me what BTU, or excuse me, what gallons per minute that BTU unit, BTU unit will provide. So if I was to look at like 120 degrees, okay, and I'm going to look at, you know, a 70 degree rise in Minnesota, 50 degree inlet water temp, I'm looking at a four and a half gallon per minute unit on the, uh, excuse me, four and a half gallons per minute with this unit. If I lived in, you know, um, Florida or whatever, where I've got a 40 degree rise, set point of 100, I'm 3.7 gallons per minute. Um, so on and so forth. Excuse me, that's backwards. But the idea is that the greater that temperature has to overcome, the fewer gallons per minute I'm going to be doing. Okay? The other thing you have to be mindful of, and the thing that we've run across quite a bit, is domestic hot water research with a tankless application. Because again, tankless water heaters are all based on flow. That's how they get triggered, okay? So when you open a sink, a faucet, you're going to create a GPM demand. That GPM demand is gonna run through the heater, the heater is gonna activate. So how do we do uh, domestic recirculation? You wanna make sure that you're looking at the instructions within the unit. I can tell you that over the years, Different manufacturers have different theories, different ideas. It uh, may be relative to their control, uh, so on and so forth. Um, this particular one we talked about, or that I'm demonstrating, they wanna make sure the recirculation pump is to provide no less than two GPM and no more than four GPM through, activated, through each activated unit. That doesn't seem like a huge obstacle or a huge problem, um, especially in my mind, I would say on the minimum, but on the maximum. Uh, the presenter before me, Dan Chudicky, uh has this great saying, and he says that there's only three sizes of pumps in the entire universe. I don't know if he went over that in this previous uh, presentation, but 
The three sizes of pumps we have in the HVA industry are too big, too small, and got lucky. Okay, And the, the majority of the time, it's safe to say they're too big. So if I've got a pump that I thought was going to do three gallons a minute, and now it's doing six gallons a minute, that's going to play uh, wreak havoc with the instantaneous heater. So balancing, fine-tuning, and actual piping becomes a lot uh, much more critical on tankless water heaters. Okay. Oop, now I messed up. There we go. The other thing to be cognizant of, with domestic hot water heaters or instantaneous domestic hot water heaters, we're doing things on the fly. And again, we have to transfer an intense or a, uh, an immense amount of energy in a very short period of time. So the heat exchangers are designed to be very uh, low mass, very turbulent, and in, in result, we end up with a higher pressure drop across that heat exchanger. So if we look at this unit here, these couple different models, if we start looking at you know, four gallons a minute that we're trying to do, we can be losing about 10 pounds of pressure. Now that's not a huge deal, right? If I'm at the bottom of the hill and the water tower is a block over, right? And I have to put a pressure reducing valve on my house because I'm you know, over 60 pounds. But there are several communities, applications where, you know, that 40 pounds to the building is a little bit more common or a little bit more normal, right? So now do you have to put a booster in to overcome something like this? Because 30 pounds coming in, or 40 pounds into the building, 10 pound drop across the heater, 30, 30 pounds out to a faucet or out of the heater to a faucet, you have the piping loss going to the faucet. Before you know it, you kind of got a trickle coming out of the faucet versus, you know, something with pressure and scrubbing ability. So again, mindful of the pressure drops because again, whatever water you're trying to heat is gonna go through that heater. You have no tank, you have no buffer. Anything coming into that building is gonna go through that heater. When to use tankless water heaters. <clears throat> a couple of scenarios that I personally came up with, you know, if you have a consistent draw for long periods of time, a tankless water heater makes sense. Okay, why pay for all this tank when it's very consistent? Ultimately, if you have something greater than a one hour runtime, you're really relying on the BTU capacity of your water heater, the storage becomes irrelevant, okay? So if you have long periods of continuous use, tankless makes sense. Um, floor space restraints, okay? If you have a medium sized load and you don't have a lot of floor space, but you can hang something on the wall or you know, whatever, you put it in a room next to it in the wall or whatever your scenario is, that is an application where a tankless makes sense. Water quality harnesses within specification tankless of a water heater manufacturer. This also we're gonna talk about kind of as a con. If you're in a soft water application or you have somebody that is very prudent with their uh, water hardness, you know, and, and softening it, a tankless makes sense, okay? If your water quality is marginal at best, something to consider. A lot of the water, the tankless water heaters, even with good water on an annual basis require a back flush or some sort of treatment, okay, um, to, to cut down the scale inside the heat exchanger. And then uh, lastly, if you have, you know, we always joke in Minnesota, you know, you never put one boiler in a building no matter how, to, how, no matter how good it is, right? Because it gets cold here, you have to have redundancy. If you want, you know, redundancy on your domestic water, which in most commercial applications is the case, you know, you can get a fair amount of BTUs, a fair amount of uh, gallons per minute of uh, heated water in a very small footprint, right? Or even on the wall. So another place where tankless makes a lot of sense. When to be cautious using a tankless water heater. There are several applications in which you have a very large dump load that you'll, you'll hear that term in, in uh, plumbing design. When you have a large dump load, i.e. like uh, concrete mixing plants are a prime example. Um, hotels or like dormitories, stuff like that, you can have large dump loads in a, in a period of time. If you're gonna use tankless with a high dump load, right, or basically a quick draw on water and then it stops, you're gonna have to size your entire water heating plant for that dump load. So in other words, 
you got this mad rush of hot water, you gotta make sure you have the BTUs to meet that mad rush in that short period of time, even though 20 hours of the day later, you don't have any demand at all, okay? So that's something to be thinking about because you don't have any um, storage with that. Be cautious where locations with water pressure, as we kind of talked about, right, in previous slides, and or gas pressure slash piping. If you were to rip out in your home a 40,000 BTU, 40 gallon water heater, you are likely going to replace it with a 200,000 BTU instantaneous tankless water heater. That's 160,000 more BTU than what you took out. Okay, so is your gas piping, is your gas line adequately sized? Do you have enough capacity for that on demand? Okay, because if you're gonna try and make four gallons a minute, if you got two showers or a shower and a dishwasher, you know, whatever, if the timing comes in right, you're gonna need that 200,000 BTUs. You know, even just one shower, you're gonna need 100,000 BTUs. So something to be very, very cognizant of. And I know when I say early days, 20 years ago, when there was a big uh, rush or a big in, in rush on water heater technology with tankless, that was something that was oftentimes overlooked, right? They just did not have the gas requirement to do it. Um, again, applications where water pressure is not ideal, and especially if water chemistry, i.e., <laughs> you know, softened water is not top priority with the person that owns that building, be very, very cognizant or very, very cautious of using a tankless water heater. Everyone's tankless water heater is a little bit different design, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to show something with relevance, but I can't. You know, your heat exchangers through there are multiple passes with, you know, sometimes half the size of my pinky in diameter. They're very, very small. The other thing with the tankless is you have no set flow rate through there. The flow rate is dependent upon how much hot water you need at any given time. So you could have a large amount of BTU firing against this very low mass that has very, very low flow through it as well. So how do we, uh, how do we bring scale you know, into formation or out of the water? Well, we heat it up, right? Give it a place to grow and attach. So with that low flow moving through the heat exchanger, now it's not scouring or stirring. It allows heat exchanger or the scale to build up on the heat exchanger that is why a lot of the tankless manufacturers will require or recommend back flushing, servicing um, with a, uh, like an anti-scale, something like a vinegar type base, or they'll have chemicals that you can back flush with your water heater, break down that scale that is built up over a year's time.